I'm Kristen Goodwin. On this episode of the Fox News Rundown, President Trump formally accepting the GOP's nomination for his re-election. With the Republican and Democratic conventions in the books, what do both parties and their candidates need in order to win in November? Fox News Radio's national correspondent Jared Halpern and Fox News Radio's political analyst Josh Kroshauer weigh in and look ahead to the remaining weeks of the election season with Arnon Mishkin, director of the Fox News Decision Desk. And several states in the Midwest are reporting an uptick in new coronavirus cases, hindering reopening plans and forcing some schools and colleges to shut down. So is America on the best track to overcome the health crisis? Johns Hopkins University professor and Fox News medical contributor Dr. Marty McCary joins the rundown to discuss the pandemic and treatment testing. Plus commentary by Guy Benson, host of The Guy Benson Show. The Fox News Rundown is a daily news podcast where we take a deeper look at the stories important to you. You can subscribe on your favorite podcast player by going to foxnewspodcast.com. I'm Janice Dean. I'm David Asman. I'm Dana Perino, and this is the Fox News Rundown. Friday, August 28th, 2020. I'm Jared Halpern. President Trump closes out the Republican National Convention with the message of promises kept. That was clearly targeted at those sort of weak Trump voters, the sort of Republican Biden curious folks and the independent Biden curious folks and sort of reminding them, hey, you know, we did a lot for you and we can do more in the future. I'm Chris Foster. We have the latest on the coronavirus pandemic, including some kids being back in school. Schools are doing a tremendous job taking a lot of precautions, and they should be open in any area without an active outbreak. Colleges uh, have been taking a lot of precautions, but where everything falls apart is with the parties. And I'm Guy Benson. I've got the final word on the Fox News Rundown. Hundreds of Republican lawmakers and supporters of President Trump gathered on the White House South Lawn, converted into a convention stage for President Trump to accept his party's nomination for a second term. My fellow Americans tonight with a heart full of gratitude and boundless optimism, I profoundly accept this nomination for President of the United States. Convention has been broken the last two weeks. Both parties relying on pre-taped speeches and productions to put on political events, mostly remotely because of the coronavirus pandemic. President Trump spent more than an hour making his case for four more years, listing legislation, executive action, nominations and confirmations, and foreign policy and military decisions accomplished in his first four years. Days after taking office, we shocked the Washington establishment and withdrew from the last administration's job-killing Trans-Pacific Partnership. I then immediately approved the Keystone XL and Dakota Access Pipelines. Ended the unfair and very costly Paris Climate Accord and secured for the first time American energy independence. And in mentioning former Vice President Joe Biden more than 40 times, the president warned of a socialist agenda that threatens the country's destiny. At the Democrat National Convention, Joe Biden and his party repeatedly assailed America as a land of racial, economic and social injustice. So tonight I ask you a simple question. How can the Democrat Party ask to lead our country when it spends so much time tearing down our country? Four years ago, President Trump pulled off a political upset few predicted in a speech capping off four nights of the Republican convention. He aimed to do it again. Down in the polls to Biden, the president offered a stark vision if the Democrats win back power. I think it was very clear that when he was giving that speech, he was thinking about the electoral map of America. Arnon Mishkin is the director of the Fox News Decision Desk. He joined me and Fox News radio political analyst Josh Crossauer about the president's path to 270 electoral college votes. And he was thinking about which states he must win in order to uh, get to 270 electoral votes in November. And I think you heard 
paragraphs or a whole theme in the speech that was clearly targeting Wisconsin, um, which you know is now the the scene of the 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 disturbances in Kenosha. And when he talked about the the, the notion that um, only he, you know, that you're not going to be safe in Joe Biden's America, he was talking about the scenes people are seeing from Wisconsin. And I think that that was the the number one box he was trying to check. The other things he was trying to check when he talked about energy independence and what and he attacked Joe Biden for the, the, the perception of his position on um, energy. Uh, he was clearly targeting and he actually mentioned them by name states like Texas, Pennsylvania and Ohio, which clearly benefit from uh, much of the, the oil industry or the fracking industry in America today. And those are states he must win. And in the case of Ohio and Texas, those are states that are looking a bit iffy or have been looking a bit iffy. And then I think when he talked about immigration, he was targeting another state that is really important to him, which is Arizona. And frankly, if he is able to hold those states and is able to hold the states he had last time, he gets to 270. Arnon, it's uh, Josh Kraushar here. Uh, The one part about the pandemic that the president discussed is his pledge to have a vaccine by the end of the year, maybe even before the end of the year, as he said, where in the, in the, but beside that, it wasn't the dominant issue of that speech. Where, where does the pandemic, where does the coronavirus fit as a top issue of, as a priority in the Fox news polling? It, it, it just seemed like the entirety of the convention didn't focus on the pand- pandemic a whole lot. Is that, is that, uh, is, there, is there a rhyme and reason for that? When you look at the, the Fox news I, polling? I, you know, when you look at the polling and it's in the Fox News poll and it's in other polls as well, the most important issue right now facing America to voters is dealing with COVID-19 and dealing with the pandemic. And it is very clear listening to the speech that he gave and listening to the first three nights of the convention that the Republicans had a very clear strategy going into this election, which was based on the growing economy and the jobs that were created and the low unemployment rate. Um, that that was the record they were they were planning to run on. And they really wanted to run against Bernie Sanders. And they had a campaign laid out to do that. And the pandemic hit and Joe Biden survived the primary season. And now they're faced with a very different sort of game. And they're trying to fit the old strategy to that new game. And so they're focused a lot on what the economy was like and what America was like before the pandemic. They use numbers about the growth and jobs and the like that came before the pandemic. They haven't yet figured out how to pivot, I think, completely to sort of articulating a vision of America given the pandemic and an explanation for why they are best suited to deal with America post pandemic. And I think that's a challenge. And they've also not figured out how you run against Joe Biden. I think, you know, he he had some he, he hit he had a few good jabs. I, I thought the, the one that was mentioned earlier about how Joe Biden embraces all the working class people, but then he votes against them. For 47 years, Joe Biden took the donations of blue collar workers, gave them hugs and even kisses. told them he felt their pain and then he flew back to Washington and voted to ship our jobs to China and many other distant lands. I thought that was a very effective theme. It's not clear to me how much of a theme they'll be, how effective it's going to be to claim that Joe Biden is a captive of, a, of the left. And we'll, we'll have to see. And I think that, you know, the, the folks at Biden headquarters are probably thinking, what can we do to really underscore that we're not Bernie Sanders? Um, and that's that's their challenge coming forward. There were a, a couple very emotional presentations on this final night of the Republican convention, Arne. And one was from Police Sergeant Ann Dorn, the widow of David Dorn, who was killed during the St. Louis protest. David is never, never coming back to me. He was murdered by people who didn't know and just didn't care. He would have done anything to help them. Violence and destruction are not legitimate forms of protest. They do not safeguard black lives. They only destroy them. The other from Carla and Marsha Mueller, the parents of Kayla Mueller, who was killed by ISIS. Let me just say this. Kayla should be here. 
If Donald Trump had been president when Kayla was captured, she would be here today. Are those types of appeals, the law and order appeal and the, the foreign policy and how President Trump has, has made decisions when it comes to, to using uh, force overseas, compelling for voters uh, in the polling data that you've seen? Absolutely. I, I think that, you know, the, one of the weaknesses that the Republican Party was trying to deal with is that Donald Trump is not seen as empathetic. And they had, you know, that Ivanka spent a long time in her speech trying to demonstrate that he, he, the empathy that he's able to show. I think they see the contrast between him and Biden as a problem and something that they need to flag, fill. And I think that one of the goals of many of those emotional speeches was to fill that gap and say, how you know he really is empathetic listen to this speech um but it's clear you know he, he, some of us are uh, some quarterbacks are passers and some quarterbacks run a running game trump is not an empathetic person um but i think you just need to sort of flesh it out on the side um because you're not going to get him to to be able to talk the way joe biden's able to talk that's just reality Arden, there was a lot of red meat rhetoric throughout this convention. And, uh, you know, when, uh, the polling has showed some surprising softness that Trump has with maybe not his his base, but with their larger Republican Party uh, support. What, well, what have you seen? Uh, did, you, did you see any chance that, that this convention actually shores up that 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 element of, of, of his coalition? I think that the first three days of the convention, I thought, had two sort of overarching goals. One was to throw red meat to his base. And it was almost puzzling how much red meat they were throwing because people like me think that that base is his and he owns it and no matter what he does, he, he holds it. I don't know why they, they felt the need to, to throw that out. And the second thing they were trying to do was shore up the message that I think the Democrats have effectively um, carried, which is, that is the, the, the weakness on race. And the belief that that Donald Trump is, I'm not going to say he's a racist because I have no idea, but that he appeals to racism. And so I think that they did a lot in terms of bringing on black speakers, but particularly black males to endorse the president, which I think was clearly targeted at the sort of less at sort of really getting African-American votes so much as getting the vote of people in the middle, many of them Republicans, many of them Republican leading independents who might have some concerns about the president on race. And I think that the thing he did, which was quite effective, going through the list of, of uh, the bills he signed, the economic uh, growth that took place in the first three years of his administration, that was clearly targeted at those sort of weak Trump voters, the sort of Republican Biden curious folks and the independent Biden curious folks and sort of reminding them, hey, you know, we did a lot for you and we can do more in the future. And I think that was um, that was, I thought, an effective part. And frankly, I thought it underscored something that, Josh, you've pointed out as well, that one of the weaknesses of the Democratic Convention was they didn't give you the litany pre-COVID of of what they thought the case against Donald Trump was. And so they didn't have that sort of three or four things you need to remember that for why you didn't like Donald Trump. They, they did a great job of reminding you you didn't like Donald Trump, but the Democrats, they didn't tell, you know, prove the case. This is Guy Benson with your Fox News commentary coming up. More than 180,000 Americans have died with COVID-19 in the seven months since the first new coronavirus case was confirmed in the U.S. President Trump, in his Republican nomination acceptance speech, says about the administration's response and efforts now. In recent months, our nation and the entire planet has been struck by a new and powerful, invisible enemy. Like those brave Americans before us, we are meeting this challenge. We are delivering life-saving therapies and will produce a vaccine before the end of the year or maybe even sooner. Overall, the last couple of weeks, the number of cases has been falling in the U.S. Still more than 5,000 Americans have died with COVID-19 in the last week alone. We've seen, a, we've seen deaths go up in Tennessee, Illinois, Kentucky, Minnesota, 
even in Wyoming. Dr. Marty McCary is a Fox News contributor based at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. It is plateauing, but that bump in deaths uh, over the last week has been very disappointing. You know, this is what's going on around the country, around the world right now. Uh, we are seeing a lag to a sort of a surge that's happened with reopening. And we knew that was going to happen. The goal is just to minimize that as much as possible. Our the United States, that is, uh, our deaths per 100 popula- uh, 100,000 of populations, so not just total cases, because obviously we have a lot more people than a lot of countries, but our deaths per capita are a lot higher than most countries. Not as high as Peru, for example, which is crazy, but uh, it's higher than most countries. And what do you attribute that to? Well, I think we had a highly variable adoption of best practices. Look, we're a very opinionated country. And when we, as a public health community, came out with recommendations, there was um, a lot of different opinions about whether or not to do these things. I mean, it took us a long time to adopt universal masking indoors in public congregate settings. Um, I think, um, you know, when you are are later in having an infection, the United States was later in getting the pandemic, then you're pulling on the same global supply chain for reagents for testing. And so we've seen um, a lot of demand for testing. I know the United States would have loved to had a ton of testing, but the reality is that you're pulling on the same global supply chain. So no matter what you do and how much money you throw at it, uh, you really just cannot ramp up testing as much as you'd like. Yeah, and we're still not there. I mean, there are places where it takes honest more than a week to get your results back, which means you may as well not have taken you may as well not even take a test unless you're going to commit to staying inside for that week. Yeah, now I can tell you that Admiral Gerard and Brad Smith and others in the administration have been working their tail off, and they have been in a position where they would are, have been willing to do everything humanly possible to get more testing in the United States. Mm -hmm. But uh, you can only do so many things. And I think the reality is that um, testing, it's, you know, we have not had manufacturing set up in the United States from these reagents. We're dependent on many of these countries. We've had many of our drugs manufactured in India and China. We just do not have a supply Mm -hmm. chain that's been set up for a crisis. And so now you have the blame game going around, right? And, and uh, remarkably, some people are using this as a political weapon. I mean, there's this new 15-minute Abbott test that's been approved. There's another, uh, uh, I guess, like a, a, a pregnancy-style test that's expected to arrive in a few weeks. So maybe, you know, maybe that will help. But you're right. I think there is obviously a lesson to be learned, whether it's learned and put into practice or not, that, about getting our supply chain back home for these things. Well, if you look at what some of the experts, and I'm going to talk about my own community here, which is uh, public health and health policy experts in academics, okay? Mm -hmm. They were saying that the only way out of this is to hire billions of public health officials and to go out there and trace everybody as to where they had spent their time and then, you know, isolate and quarantine those individuals. Now, that's good public health practice, and we should do that. But the reality is that that is not how we dug ourselves out of the pandemic. Okay, that is not the reason why New York had dramatic declines after their pandemic surge. Okay, we need to do it. It's important. We need to fund it. But the idea of remember that motto, testing, 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 testing is not what got us out of the pandemic. Okay, testing is important and it's necessary and it's helpful. But what got us out of the pandemic was best practices with universal masking and avoiding dense congregate settings. And if you look at a lot of the parts of the country now that are still struggling with the virus, look at the Rio Grande Valley of Texas, where they're still getting hammered, okay? There's a certain elitism to say, oh, if we just test and contact trace low-income Americans who live in very dense uh, housing because they're poor, that somehow we're going to you know, rescue them from the pandemic. So there has been a certain elitism, which has been very uh, disturbing to hear from the experts. Uh, schools have been open in some parts of the country for a couple of weeks now. Uh, in Florida, it's reported that a, a few thousand kids are infected. A few hundred have been hospitalized. Some districts in the Northeast, for example, are still trying to figure out what they're going to do when they reopen in a couple of weeks. What, what are you seeing? What do you think about schools? 
I think uh, schools are doing a tremendous job taking a lot of precautions, and they should be open in any area without an active outbreak, okay? Mm-hmm. Colleges uh, have been taking a lot of precautions, but, but Chris, where everything falls apart is with the parties. Right. Okay. Well, once there, once people are engaging in these off-campus congregate settings, it jeopardizes everything. And people say kids are kids, but you know what? Most kids are taking a lot of precautions and taking this seriously. And kudos to them. Right. That, that that's impressive. But a small group are, are placing it uh, the the entire student body at risk. Um, schools for kids, you know, up to high school age. We got to remember the data is is pretty clear. About a hundred deaths of kids using a, a broad definition of kids is anyone from zero to 20. It's been a hundred deaths uh, roughly since the beginning of the pandemic in the United States total. So we got to remember that's comparable to seasonal flu, to viral meningitis, to pneumonia. Um, so we got to remember the consequences again. And think about the elitism with a one size fits all policy. Kids in inner city Baltimore are not going to be as safe with schools closed being at home or on the streets as in Santa Barbara County. And so uh, child abuse is a concern, substance abuse, suicide rates. We've seen the calls go up on that stuff. So we've got to think about the the entire picture. But kids should go to school unless there's an active outbreak. Um, Talk about this convalescent plasma thing that has uh, has some people worked up. Um, Stephen Hahn at the FDA the other day said, look, he kind of screwed up and maybe have overstated the benefits, but you say it's a perfectly good therapy. Gosh, convalescent plasma has been around for a century. They were using it in 1918 for the Spanish flu. And for the CDC to finally say something that was long overdue, and that is doctors are authorized to use it. That is, a patient doesn't have to be in a formal trial. They can use it. If you don't have an infrastructure at your small community hospital to put a patient on a formal study that's paid for by a you know, a, a grant, then the FDA authorization said, finally, you can use this. 70,000 Americans have used, has, have had convalescent plasma. And then somehow we're saying there's not sufficient data for an emergency use authorization. Again, some elitism coming from the academic center saying, we just don't know because th- we did not use the study design of giving some patients placebo and comparing sick COVID patients on placebo or nothing versus sick uh, COVID patients with the convalescent plasma and comparing mathematically the results. Well, guess what? When you have 70,000 patients who have had this, uh, uh, this therapy and impressive results, as we saw from the Mayo Clinic, which by the way, reported on 35,000 of the patients, I don't speak for Johns Hopkins, but Johns Hopkins has had patients on convalescent plasma from early on. Um, I mean, I think it's unethical to do a study where you put a sick COVID patient on placebo, right. given the, the, the learning that we've had from convalescent plasma being effective. And the reason it's effective is, as the study shows, it has antibodies in that plasma. And that's actually... Uh, a bridge to the next step, which is going to be antibody therapies. And I think they'll beat vaccines to market. Uh, one more. Uh, we're seeing more protests uh, in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Uh, we just had the Sturgis bike rally. Are the fears about all these gatherings for not? I know that there's been some cases traced to the Sturgis bike rally, but have we been more OK than we might have thought just by virtue of being outside? Well, what we've seen with cases going up and down and undulating around the world is that when people start feeling confident, when they start feeling complacent about the pandemic, that's when we start seeing a bump. And if you look at what's happening nationwide, there's one clear factor which predicts how many people are going to die from the infection, and that is how seriously people take it. And so when people loosen up Uh, and and get overconfident, that's when we see bad things happening. Now, during the protests, if we can look back at uh, Memorial Day, the protests nationwide did not directly cause a massive surge in cases nationwide. As a matter of fact, after the protests in the six weeks following, throughout the months of June and the first half of July, 
we saw a massive decline in the north and a surge in the Sun Belt. And we know the protests were more common uh, in the northern parts of the United States. We did, however, see small increases in places like Minnesota, where we know many of the protesters were not using precautions. Outdoors is safer than indoors. That's one of the take home messages. But also, you know, complacency is one of the big risks, especially as we uh, run the risk of colliding into the seasonal flu uh, in November and December. Dr. Marty McCary, best-selling author, professor, surgeon uh, with Johns Hopkins University, a Fox News contributor. Dr. McCary, thank you once again for coming on the Fox News Rundown today. Great to be with you, Chris. From the Fox News Podcasts Network, in these ever-changing times, you can rely on Fox News for hourly updates for the very latest news and information on your time. Listen and download now at foxnewspodcast.com or wherever you get your favorite podcasts. Rate and review the Fox News Rundown on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. And now, some good news with Tanya J. Powers. A U.S. Marine who put his football career on hold to serve his country will now be wearing a different kind of uniform, one for the New England Patriots. According to the New England Sports Network, Paul Questenberry last played a game in 2014 when he played for Navy. He became a Marine the next year. He's now 28. He got a tryout this month with the Patriots, which led to the signing of his first pro deal. He was a defensive end in college, but is set to convert to tight end. Questenberry will be the third of his family members to play pro football. His brothers, David and Scott, have played in the NFL, too, according to the Capitol Gazette. David played for the Tennessee Titans, and Scott is currently with the L.A. Chargers. Military.com reports that the Patriots have had a history of taking flyers on players who've had military backgrounds or who came from military or law enforcement families. Running back James White's parents worked in law enforcement in Florida. Rex Burkhead's dad was an FBI agent. Jason and Devin McCurdy's father served in the U.S. Army. And Joe Cardona served in the U.S. Navy. Tanya J. Powers, Fox News. It's time for your Fox News commentary. Guy Benson. What's on your mind? Following the death of civil rights icon John Lewis, a star-studded funeral was held for him in Atlanta, Georgia. There is virtually no social distancing at that funeral, and politicians returning to Washington, D.C. were given an exemption from the city's mayor, Muriel Bowser, to her administration's rules involving self-quarantine. Similarly, the New York Post now reports that celebrities and musical artists arriving in the Big Apple to participate in MTV's annual Video Music Awards from states deemed to be high risk by New York will also get an asterisk. Instead, participants will just have to socially distance and wear masks. But when politicians demand that people obey various orders and claim the mantle of science, then make exceptions to those rules that have nothing to do with science and everything to do with the status of the people who get the exemption, that undermines public confidence and breeds resentment. This is Guy Benson, host of The Guy Benson Show. You've been listening to the Fox News Rundown. Rundown. Stay up to date by subscribing to this podcast at foxnewspodcasts.com. And for up-to-the-minute news, go to foxnews.com. It's the latest from Fox News Podcasts, The Campaign with Brett Baer, with updates from reporters on the trail and in-studio experts. Brett keeps you informed on the 2020 race. Go to foxnewspodcasts.com and download The Campaign with Brett Baer now. Love Fox News? Click the subscribe button to get more of the news and opinion you trust. And click the Fox News Rundown playlist for the latest episodes.